Villain Saga Season 2, Episode 20. Who is this? Oh, it's him. Have fun. I think they enjoyed a little bit more. Yep. It's another day in the farm core. This is us just winning with superior numbers. They're not even trying. That was so nicely made. That was so beautiful. So smooth. Yeah, you think you can do it. It's different when it's real. He's just toying with him. Whoa, that actually looked amazing. That actually... Oh, wait, who was that? A snake, that's why. Kale's a weak man, leading a weak army. Can you make that call? But they're just, yeah, they're waiting for that, that opportunity. Their enthusiasm just evaporated. Go ahead, Kettle, after you. You first. This is already over. It's over. They're defeated. Their only hope is the great warrior Olmar. There's some truth to that. He's not, not wrong. I mean, Kettle's very, very acutely experiencing this right now. <laughs> I thought they would want him alive or something, but no. Episode 20, pain. Pain indeed. That, yeah, that just happened. Okay, that makes sense. I, I'm really curious to see what the, how Thorgal performs here. I don't trust it. Seems a little bit too easy, too exposed for Canute. Oh, he really did get caught. So time for <laughs> taunts. Maybe he hadn't been so enthusiastic and excited and, you know, running and yelling. He might actually have had a chance. It's quick reflexes. <laughs> it's pretty badass. And he just decided to come in shirtless, no less. Canute's best skill is his wits. There it is. Someone just throw a sword? Uh, that's not the way. I, I don't think you choke Thorgal out with brute strength. Well, he's actually doing it. That's some real strength right there. Oh, that was so painful. He's down a hand. Still expecting some badass lines. Or just a primal yell. <laughs> In all this, he respects him. Where is he going? You know, they might have actually stood a chance that they had coordinated. They're all on the same page. So Snake survives. For now. Uh, no. He, I don't know. I don't think he's gonna make it. So what now, Snake? Where do you go from here? Oh, he's alive. This is not how I remember the plot of Seven Samurai. She chose to come back to this for these two. I don't know if Thorfinn feels 100% the same about that. I heard about this cool place called Vinland. Or just leaves house. That's good too. She's now very aligned with Thorfinn. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing for both Orphan and Arnie. It's not that they're going to eliminate any any of that. Nobody ever will. I think her dream sequence in the last episode speaks more directly to the answer, which is that you're always going to be in the forest to some extent. You know, there's that whole Attack on Titan thing, keeping the kids out of the forest. And the meaning there is slightly different. But at the same time, they're, oh, they're always kind of going to be in the forest. The forest is always there. There's no utopia. There's no escape. I mean, you can experience safety and that's a blessing, but it doesn't change the, the realities of the world. It doesn't change the realities of the threats that could reemerge at any time, even in, in the safest of places. You don't bury your head in the sand. You don't ignore it. You want to face it and you're probably strongest when you're aligned with the full truth, even though it's really difficult to get there or even aim for it. So you look at it, you try to understand as best as you can the depths of evil. And in doing so, you understand the significance of not contributing to it. And then you buckle down and you see yourself as connected to the whole and you do as good good as you can do in your sphere of influence, which probably is largely just yourself. Einar and Thorfinn are very much in the forest, part of the forest, but they're noble creatures. They're majestic. They're a wolf and a deer that are very much a part of it, but at the same time are better than it. And it's hard to directly impact but at the same time, it's it's a bigger impact than it feels intuitively, where you do that and you, you just trust other people to do the same, or you be the influence for other people to be the same. Through truth, not through deception, not through coercion or force. You try to spread truth and get as much of an understanding, a real deep understanding, so that it's not just you, it's a note of people like you. And I think that's the only way that anything really great happens. <laughs> where, where are you going? Oh, she's stepping back. I thought she had made it. It's heartbreaking, not just for her, but Thorfinn and Inner who gave everything to this pain. Uh, there's, there's still a chance, right? There's still a chance. No, 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 no. Talk to her. Talk to her. Talk her out of this. Not that you can talk someone out of this, but talk her out of it. Wrong. 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 Maybe to actually do some good. Say what you gotta say. Oh, who, who even knows like what's broken uh, this is, at least it's honest it's what he need, he wants what he needs but what Arnie has to live for is not, is not that but the beauty she's capable of experiencing in her own life and the good she's able to do herself damn it I had a little bit of hope there. After all that, we did all that. God, they must be so powerless right now. Einar again, not being able to save someone. It's real pain. Oh man, in this situation, you just might, you might just feel like you're cursed. You just might feel like it's pointless. Like what's, the, why even bother? Like Arnie was saying, for all the philosophizing, for all the insight, what does it mean if you can't even save one person is how I think I would probably feel in that situation. Even before this episode, what Kettle did was horrific, disgraceful, unforgivable. The fact that they both died just makes it all the more grotesque for him. There's like no, no redeeming it. There's no survival and apology or whatever it could be. Even if it was a foregone conclusion based on her injuries, to see her give up like that emotionally is sad, but it's also really understandable given that man for Arnie, it's just been one thing after another. Sad not just not just for her, but for everybody in this cart right now. I'm still waiting, like half hoping for her to come back. This is Leaf's story. Leaf really planted a seed. Yeah. And this doesn't speak to the reality, it speaks more to hope, which I think is really important right now. We're really seeing Thorfinn now. And now imagine facing Kettle. Speaking of tests.
Uh, understandable. Thorfinn's fighting a hard battle, man. He's gonna be fighting a- oh, oh, no, no, no. I mean, I get it, but no. This is just Thorfinn's life, man. So tough. It's so tough to go there and stay there and live there. It's, it's kind of lonely for Thorfinn. I'm pretty convinced that you can't actually bring someone out of that. You, you can't bring someone to where you are emotionally or mentally through pleading or through force or anything like that. The only reason it got through or worked in any measure was because Einar is already largely that person. Aside from the tragedy of Arnit's death and my sadness for the people left behind, I'm hit with an even greater feeling of the magnitudes of what Thorfinn is facing, what his struggles are going to be, what a lonely and losing battle it will be most of the time, and also how difficult it is to occupy that space in the in the face of real challenges. I mean, saying it out loud is one thing when nothing's going wrong, but like even me watching this, I, you know, would I shed a tear if Kettle died? Absolutely not. Do I feel the same rage towards Kettle? Of course. Would I stop Einar? Almost definitely not. Truth is, I don't really know. Like, it's one thing to look at it, watch it from afar. It's another thing to be in that situation. Arnie's death just has a way of making this all feel hopeless. It feels really to her question of what's the point. I know it's there. I mean, I have an answer, but it, it just doesn't, it doesn't come up much organically. It doesn't spring to mind right at this moment. Snake's there too, in his way. He tried to stop it. Maybe villain's out there somewhere. He's got a long road, he's got a lot of work to do. What else? I mean, what else do you do? I don't know. And this is only increased his resolve. Once he left, he was never going back. There is no return to his childhood, as tempting as that might be. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. It's like the final barrier. Like, I mean, he has to... With this kind of thing, it's all, it's all in or nothing. I don't know. I don't think that's it. I don't think that's his path. He's just more awake than ever, if not a little bit insane and crazy, which, I mean, again, understandable. Man, pain is right. It was a rough one. It's really interesting to me that what made Thorfinn move, what got him pointed towards Canute, is the, the speech about God. God is watching. Maybe at some points in the show, it's been expressed that God doesn't care, right? That God just has a sort of universal acceptance of things that are happening, and that that is maybe a, a deeper love, a richer love than humans can experience because it's conditional. The thought just occurred to me watching Thorfinn talk you know, watching all this tragedy unfold and thinking about God, that there's another reading, that there is maybe a more direct and personal love that comes from God. And in this case, I'm not talking necessarily about a religious God, but just, I don't know, forces of existence. And if you've heard me talk about this before, I apologize. It's a very particular set of beliefs that I have, but I do think there's a case to be made that there's an objective value system based on what you see in, in just existence itself in the natural world, where the proliferation and expansion of the systems of the world and life itself represents a, a value system, that, that those things are, are good, you know, that those things happen even despite what would be more natural, which are the, the built-in forces of decay, destruction, atrophy, yet life persists. And you think that maybe the reason there's struggle at all is because the system that best supports life contains conflicting forces that when in opposition to each other, when they clash, create conflict. So for example, survival is a beautiful thing. One has an instinct to survive and that is that is natural, God-given. Accumulating resources, getting things that are important for your survival and, and for procreation are built in, but create conflict because things are scarce. So it's not that the underlying drives are bad. It's not that, you know, the uh, human's animal nature is bad. It's that the drives often turn around against themselves. And then there's this higher level of thinking, which is humans have the ability to think abstractly, think about the future, think about systems, think about ripple effects of things. And so there's there's a higher level where you can forego immediate needs and, and see beyond immediate conflict for something greater greater, which I would argue actually enhances the ability of, of any individual to survive and, and thrive. Saying all that, if you look at it that way, right, if you look at this as a, a carefully crafted system or a system that evolves through natural processes and trial and error and natural selection, then that's a fractal. The human experience and the human struggle is a fractal of the, the struggle and the challenges of life itself and maybe 
reality of existence itself. And so humans fighting to do better, humans battling to overcome these challenges and live at the highest frequency possible, you might argue that you are fighting God's battle. You know, you are a warrior of God. And if you are not in aligned with the, the natural value system that emerges through through close inspection of life and the world. You could, and I think many times are conceived as a warrior of an opposing side, whatever whatever name you give to that evil. So maybe it's not indifference. Maybe it's actually a, a heavy investment in the way things go and a heavy, heavy investment in humanity, not in like a, a cognizant conscious sense of, you know, some, some spiritual being looking down with human-like eyes and a human-like brain and thinking about people, not like that, but the fact that there is maybe a, a good and there is an evil, for lack of a better word, and it's it's kind of a conceptual stretch, but th there's a want in there. If there's a good and a bad and there's an objective or even just a, a pathway, an incentive pathway towards something, that's almost a desire in a very, very zoomed out sense. And it's way bigger than humanity, right? But looking at it the other way, it makes more sense because humans can align themselves with that want. Humans can align themselves with that objective and that desire and, and be a support for this kind of divine good rather than uh, an opposition or an enemy and like what could be more significant than that like name a cause that's greater than that to be accountable to existence itself I'm not exactly sure what Thorfinn was going through I'm not sure why his speech about God led to this increased conviction and you know going full in as opposed to just like I want peace I want to end war and slavery but not that I can do in this situation turning around deciding to just go head first into it at great personal risk to himself but I can feel something bigger something more satisfying than the the preacher's speech back in season one and Canute's interpretation of it. And now he goes out to face Canute, which in many ways feels like his destiny.